North County boy, Kyle McClellan. What's going, what's going on, Kyle? Uh, not much, man. How you guys doing? We're doing good, dude. And uh, we actually we were just talking about um, Boy Scouts. I don't know why. We just go in so many different directions. And, and we're, I was thinking to myself, and I'm looking at the, the dais here with the guys I work with, and I'm like, if we were stuck out in the middle of the woods, we would all probably die because they don't know what to do. But then I'm thinking, Kyle, though, with you, I'm sure you know what you're doing if you got stuck out in the middle of the woods, right? I could survive. Yes. I could make it. I'm stealthy. I'm um, resourceful. And if I needed to, I could use my hands and, you know, catch dinner. You're stealthy. Last stealthy. time I saw you, your arms were so damn big. I don't know if you're going to be that <laughs> stealthy out there, man. Uh, so what's going on? What have you been up to, bud? I was just chasing the kids, man. We're, uh, you know, doing my sons in uh, baseball, playing basketball still. It feel like basketball season never ends. Um, my daughter's in softball and soccer, so chasing them around, doing stuff uh, with, with our foundation and, you know, watching some ball games here and there as well from the Cardinals and the Blues. So, Kyle, Charlie Marlowe here. I think the last time I saw you, if I'm not mistaken, was spring training. I believe it was 2020 right before COVID, and if I'm not mistaken, I think at the time, both you and Cam Jansen, weren't you guys going to do American Ninja Warrior? Oh, God. And then I don't know if um, if COVID ended that. So is that still on the table at all? Uh, we were going to do it. You know, they reached out and asked um, if Cam and I would train a little bit and then and then go on the show. They were hosting it in St. Louis. And um, so I was, uh, when I talked to the guy, the, the producer, I said, he asked how big I was. I said, well, I'm about 6'3", you know, 230. And he said, yeah, you'd be the biggest ninja we've ever had. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's not really built for guys like you. Um, but I was uh, I was looking forward to it. You know, I've had six arm surgeries and four of those Ooh. were shoulders. So I don't know how well I would have done on, on, uh, on some of it. But uh, I was looking forward to the challenge. And then, yeah, COVID wrecked it. Um, and so they, they called and said, hey, we're, we're shelving it for right now. If we come back to St. Louis, we'll let you guys know. But um, – I, my kids were more excited than anything. You know, they were like, wait, do we get to be down there and be like in the cheering section? Um, so they were really excited about it. But uh, maybe maybe one day me and Cam will get to go at it on the course. So it obviously looks like you're still able to to move pretty heavy weight. You mentioned that uh, the six surgeries, does that still hinder you at all now with just kind of what you're trying to do in everyday life? Um, not really every day. I mean, I feel it. You know, I, I'm heading to the gym now and there's there's things I can't do and there's things I got I to gotta scale back on. Um, yeah, there's also things that just aren't worth doing <laughs> as you yeah. get, uh, you know, older in age, it's just not worth putting up some of the numbers. So it's just having to, having to be smart, but you know, my, my biggest thing when I had my, my final surgery, they, they removed my bicep tendon. And I said, uh, I told Dr. Flood, I said, I just want to be able to play catch with my kids. I want to be able to throw football, play catch with my kids. I don't need to throw. I don't need to compete anymore. And, uh, and I can do that. I can throw BP to them. We play catch almost every day. I can throw them fly balls, you know, I'm helping coach both their teams and, um, so I can do all of that, um, and and it doesn't get in the way. But there's there's not a day that I don't that I'm not reminded about uh, the wear and tear that's on that shoulder, and and uh, and feel it every day. You can still cast a line too when you go fishing, right? That's on the oh, yeah, that. yeah, and shoot no, I, I and can get stuff those out there. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what do you do with all the outdoorsman terms? Well, well, and that and that how you say it? I'm not very outdoorsy. Yeah. I act like I am, although I did grow up in the middle of the woods. But I did, I wasn't <laughs> taught well. I blame that on my parents. Well, hold on, Kyle. You got to hear these stories though, because. As you know, Cam Jansen's a, a good old Eureka boy, but he's oh, moved yeah. out there to St. Albans. I've, I've seen, yeah. And you think he's living this kind of, you know, snooty life. He's dealing with snakes, yes. with coyotes. He had to go to his neighbor's house and actually kill a snake for his neighbor? Yes, I did, Kyle. And these little these coyotes, are with their beady red eyes, are, are looking into my house at my cat and my two puppy dogs. Like, bring them out, Cam. Bring, bring out the puppies, Cam. We want to hang out with them and have some fun. It ain't happening, Kyle. I'll kill him with my bare hands. Hey, let me I ask. Like it. Hey, like it. hey, isn't it weird? Like, we're both, uh, we're both uh, 84, born in 84. You're from North County. I'm a Eureka boy out there. We kind of did the same thing. You're playing baseball. I was playing hockey, man. We got drafted the same year in 02. Like, when did you know? Like, when did you know? Like, when you were a big kid growing up, like, when did you know that you had some heat and you had something going and, and, and like, you were confident that you were going to kind of go to the next level in baseball? You know, it's, um, I try to tell people all the time as I'm going through it with my kids now, um, you know, I can, I can so remember being in, in their position and my kids, they're, they're 10 and eight. Um, 
and as they get a little bit older, even, you know, I think maybe applies more, but my eighth grade year, I was tiny. Like I didn't, I, I got blown past on, uh, you know, in, in terms of development and stuff. And, and I couldn't throw the ball very far or hard. And, you know, I, these other kids are passing by. And then my freshman year, I started to kind of catch back up a little bit. And it was my sophomore year when I kind of figured out, Hey, I got a chance. I, I uh, actually made the varsity team. And I was like, that, that to me was like the, the, the push I needed to say like, man, other people think, you know, that I'm, that I, I have some skills and, uh, and I'm ready to, to really dig in and commit to this and, uh, and, and really earn that spot and, and show them that, that they made the right decision. And so my sophomore year, I kind of started to go and, um, and then by my junior year, you know, physically I caught up with everybody and, and everything started to kind of come together. So my junior, you know, I didn't think I had a chance to go to the, to, you know, professional. I thought maybe I could go play baseball in college, you know, maybe junior college, you know, somewhere in college, I don't know, but, um, and then all of a sudden my senior year, it took off and, um, I was throwing in the low nineties and, and, uh, and that's when everything opened up for me, but it was late. You know, it's, I, I try to tell people all the time, these kids that, you know, are eight, nine, 10 years old and their parents think they're the best player in the state and <laughs> they got state rankings on them. You know, I'm like, wait a second, when's the last time you've seen a 10 year old ranked in the state? Cause I've never seen that. I don't know where those rankings <laughs> are, but apparently parents have them everywhere. And, uh, and it, you know, it's all about at this point, develop them make sure they enjoy it and have fun because right now at, at 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, you don't know who's going to be the good one. You know, you don't know who's going to be the stud. Um, it's going to take a while. So develop their skills, give them an all around, make them an all around player, teach them the, the, uh, the intangibles of, you know, being a good teammate, working hard, work ethic and all those things. And then when everything comes together and they have all the other stuff, that's when you really see kids start to take off. And Kyle, we want to get to the Cardinals here, but you brought up something that I find very interesting there. So I got two kids, but my, my daughter, who's my oldest, is four, so we're doing t-ball with her for the first time, and, and you got kids, obviously, you're coaching them all that, and I hear I hear so much from uh, my friends who have kids who are older, and they kind of just tell me about what they think is going well with kind of coaching and the whole system of, of athletics now with personalized coaching, and yep. they have these centers you can go to and specialized training, so what do you think it, whether it's in terms of baseball or another sport, what do you think folks are doing right in terms of youth sports and what are folks doing wrong man youth sports is such a complicated uh, topic i mean in general the, the the difference from now to 20 years ago is that you know a kids at 12 years old are having to pick a sport um and i hate that you know you you have to uh, because all these sports are competing for the kids time so they want them 10 11 12 months a year you know, there's no stopping. And the hard part is like, as much as you want to fight it and say, this isn't right, you know, and you see, like, you see all the posts saying like, kids are worn out, kids are quitting, kids aren't having fun, kids are getting injured, you know, all these things. And you know, and like, you know, people especially have been through it, know that like you playing X amount of tournaments as a nine-year-old isn't going to make you an NHL player or a NBA player or a major league baseball player. That's not, you know, what's doing it. Um, but it's hard because if, if you if you want if your kid likes it and you want to play competitive, you have to, you know, kind of keep track with some of these other ones, or else you're going to be so far behind that it will be hard to catch up. And so it's a really tricky thing. You know, the hard part is there's you know there's like beginner stuff and then there's super advanced. To find that middle ground is really really hard. Um, and and so, you know, I think parents, our job is to. I, I was actually up at Mizzou yesterday um, with the softball team. My daughter was up there. I uh, got to meet the players and coaches and I was talking to the coach and I, I said, our job as parents is to steward our kids and, and to make sure that we're giving them what they need, but not overwhelming them and letting them, you know, go off the deep end of, you know, just playing too much. The kids don't know, right. They're going to sign, they, they sign up, they're going to do wherever you take them. Um, but being sure that we steward that as parents and not get caught up in it. So, you know, I think parents, what they do well is they're, they're giving their kids an opportunity. What they don't do well is they're, they're way too into it, you know, way too, um, <laughs> you know, worried about winning a, a eight, nine, 10, 11 year old tournament uh, versus, you know, just going out and developing them. And don't, don't, you know, don't worry about the wins and losses. That's hard to say. I'm coaching. Like I love to win. Don't get me wrong, but man, at the end of the day, my daughter last weekend, two weekends ago, they went one and three. It was a great weekend for them. They learned a lot. They competed. They, they just fell a little bit short, but they, they learned some of the things that they can do to go the other way. So it's not about winning the tournament. It's not about, you know, winning every game. 
you know, I always say you want to be in that 60, 70 percent winning range. And that's when you know you're in the right spot. You're losing some, you're winning some, um, but you're competitive. And that's that's where you want to be, I think. Hey, Kyle, uh, what did you make of the situation earlier this week with Clayton Kershaw being pulled from the game? 80 pitches, perfect game going and they take him out. I mean, new new game, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it is. And look, you know, I've seen Tony La Russa do this a lot. Um, it was it, it, May 15th is kind of unofficially what I've noticed being with Tony. May 15th was the day where he he let the horses run. Um, before May 15th, he held them back. Um, and, and the whole thing is, and I, when I say horses, I'm talking Adam Wainwright, Chris Carpenter. You would see them go and they'd get to that 85, 90 pitch range and he'd pull them. And then May 15th, it was like, if, if you have a chance and you're going, you know, seven, eight innings and you're going 115, that's okay. But, I, you know, they kind of shelter him, especially coming out of a, a, a spring training that was very quick. Kershaw coming off injuries last year, I can kind of see it. Um, you know, it's just not worth trying to do it this early in the season um, to, to risk potentially, you know, one of your – obviously your your studs, one of the best to, to, to do, it, do it in the game. Um, but – I will say with, with that being said, we're seeing that a lot, you know, not just the first part of the season, you know, it, it, it seems like analytics tell everybody that uh, they don't want starting pitchers to see the lineup the third time through. And, you know, that that's definitely been a change in the game the last handful of years. Don't you think Kyle, that a role that, that you um, uh, performed in the MLB and also, you know, you're a starter a little bit, you know, you you're a reliever. I feel like a guy like that nowadays is even more valuable in yeah. terms of those swing guys, the bulk relievers who can come out and throw, let's say, two, two and a third. I yeah. feel like those guys are more valuable than ever. You're definitely seeing your middle relievers uh, value increase more than ever in the game. And, you know, it was starting pitching and closers, right? I mean, the middle relief kind of uh, was a non-factor. And your, your starting pitchers and your closers were the ones that were, you know, getting the high salaries and, and they were they were the ones in high demand. Uh, middle relievers were typically failed starters or failed rel- failed closers. Um, and now you're seeing these guys are having a huge role because starters are. I mean, I think I saw a stat where in the first week starters went 4.6 innings on average um, for the first week of the season. So wh- there was a game. I think it was the Cardinals game. Uh, guy had a chance for a win and the four and didn't go back out for the fifth. And it was like holy cow. I mean, the guy's got a four or five round lead and couldn't make it through five. And and that that would drive me nuts, man. It was like that. You got to at least go five. Our, our rule in our starting pitching was uh, Wainwright always said, you know, you got to go five to five to six is kind of what they say for a quality start. He's like, that ain't quality. We need seven. You know, we, we expect you to go seven and that's just changed. You know I mean? Starters are going, you know, four or five innings and then they got those middle guys going, you know, two or three in the middle of that. So they're definitely, their value in the middle part of that bullpen is definitely going up. Kyle with Albert Pujols joining the Cardinals again, uh, I know you played with him for a handful of years. I just want to ask if you got any life advice or any uh, any advice of, from him in general uh, when you were playing with the Cardinals and uh, what he, what he meant to you as a as a teammate. Albert was a guy in the minor leagues. I I worked out with a lot of the local guys, and uh, and Albert was one of them. You know, Ryan Howard, Kerry Robinson, uh, John Mavery, Mike Matheny. A lot of those guys were working out, and I got invited to go and just kind of learn and and sit around and be around them and. So I knew Albert in the minor leagues and then getting to play with him, um, you know, and it's, it's just, it was incredible to watch, you know, nothing specific from him, but you know, we, we became good friends and um, just watching him every day prepare for what he had to go through. I, I say all the time, you know, Albert had to prepare himself differently than everybody else that I ever played for, played with because the weight and the, the status that he carried, he had to perform every day, you know, like I could come in and, and uh, not really be dialed in and go out there and do my job. I wasn't that great at it. You know, for Albert, it was like, I mean, he had to deal with so much when he got to the field and it took so much preparation. And, um, you know, I, the, the superstar players, I have so much respect for of, of how they um, prepare and execute day in and day out. I mean, those guys don't take a day off mentally. Uh, it's something I've never seen. So uh, preparation for sure. And just the way he saw the game. I think Jose Okendo had a lot to do with it. Uh, Jose Okendo, Albert, and Yachty played their own little game with each other that uh, that was so far above everybody else. And and I had a chance when I was on the DL to sit by Cheo and just just pick his brain and just watch what he's doing. And um, he poured a lot into those guys. And I think the the things that you see on the field come from a lot of those conversations and a lot of that insight of 
uh, they see the game differently than anybody else, and, and they see it extremely well. So, Kyle, we are five games in for the Cardinals, a couple of uh, rainouts, but they're 3-2. and two. They lose the opener to Milwaukee yesterday. What do you think of this Cardinals team? I mean, do you think they're a legit, are they a World Series contender? Do you like them more than Milwaukee? What are you seeing so far? They got a pitch. Their starting pitching is going to be their Achilles heel uh, all season long. They're going to hit. They're going to play defense. Um, it's going to come down to their starting pitching. And, you know, you got some injuries in there. So their depth is being tested right out of the gate. You got Hudson coming off an injury. You got Hicks coming off two years of injury, um, trying to end the rotation. You got Wainwright, who's 40 years old. Um, you got a lot of question marks. You know, Michaelis hasn't had, uh, you know, a, a full season of health here in a while. And, and so it, there's a lot of question marks in that starting rotation. And, and so I think that's going to be their key. Um, and especially you get to the postseason, you know, that starting pitching is so, so critical. So it'll be interesting to see how that takes shape and develops throughout the season. But that, that to me is the one thing I'm watching. I think their bullpen's, you know, fine and in good shape. They got, they also have some depth there that they can go down and, and get uh, in the minor leagues and bring up. Um, but I, they're going to hit and they're going to play defense. I mean, that's for sure. And so I think it's going to come down to, uh, to the pitching side of things. And, and you mentioned earlier about playing back in the day with all those guys, with Albert, with Yachty, with Wayno. And you look at the typical Major League Baseball career. Do you just marvel at the fact that these guys who were your teammates, what, I yeah. mean, now 14, <clears throat> 14, 13 years ago, three <laughs> of these guys who are either in their 40s or, I guess, are they all in their 40s? I think Yachty's going to be 40 this be summer. Right. I mean, all of them are still playing at a high level at that age. I mean, that, that's not normal. No, it's not. And, 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 uh, you know, I think it's, I think it's probably weird for them. Like Albert left for 10 years, right? <laughs> yeah. So he looks then younger he comes back. They, then he comes back and all the guys are just like, Hey, we're still here doing the same thing. We were 10 years ago. <laughs> Nothing's changed. We've held the culture. We've held the, you know, we've held the line on, on the clubhouse. And, and so when you come back in Albert, it's going to be the same as kind of where you left it and, and the things you expect. You know, those guys are have, have stewarded the organization so well um, and, and continued a lot of the tradition. One one small thing um, that a lot of people probably don't notice that to me, I was so I like I just love seeing it because it's something that I know was important to the organization when I went through it and was was enforced on the players. If you go back to opening day and you look at the ceremony and you look at the picture when both teams are on the line um, doing the national anthem. You go back to 2011, look at the picture with us and the Texas Rangers. I actually went back to 2006, and somebody slipped up on it. But the Cardinals, when they're lined up, all the players have no jackets and no sweatshirts on. They're all wearing their uniforms on the line. The staff, the, the training staff, everybody's uniformed, and they're standing on the line. That might not seem like a big deal. That's a big deal. That is a, that is a tradition. That is a culture. That is a attention to detail that has been carried on in the organization for a long time. And those are things as a young player – that you're taught of this is the way we do things. Now you look on the other sideline and every three players have a hoodie on, yep. you know, and it just, it just doesn't, you know, is it a big deal? No, it's not a big deal, but that tells you that they've held the line. They've continued the culture. Um, and, and, and this is a new manager, right? But attention to detail and tradition, I think goes a long way. And um, that to me, when I was at opening day, I saw that. I was like, man, I love that. I love that Adam and Yachty are still enforcing some of the things that I think makes this organization set apart from others. Does it does it really matter that they don't have their jackets on? No, I mean that you know it's not a big deal. But Cam gets it. You know, yeah, like there's a certain way we do things, and uh, and an expectation. We're going to be professional, and uh, and we're going to have attention to detail. And to me, that that stood out on opening day. You know, more than anything of, uh, you know, Ollie's carrying it on. Adam and Yachty still have control of that clubhouse. Yeah, it gets a little annoying when it comes like Lou Lamarillo did the same thing where you couldn't tuck your jersey in, same tape, same color on your sock. Like everything was disciplined. You can't. But then you're, you kind of complain about it, but then you look and see how classy you look. And it all yep. comes together, and optically, just, just everything. You're just, you're just a team, and it shows, yep. and I love that. Yep. But, but, Kyle, you are such a better person than me in so many different ways. And I do want to say, man, like, when, we were, when I was playing here, you were doing your thing. Like, you'd hook me up with tickets. I threw the first pitch out to you, man. You'd, wa you'd come watch me play and stuff like that. I'd watch you play. It was such a cool thing. But you, you your charity work, like, like I— Sometimes I watch what you do, and I'm like, I just look at myself in the mirror and say, you need to do better, Cam. <laughs> and, like, so tell me what you got going. I know you've been out in Haiti and, just, you know, just hardcore places, doing all kinds of stuff. So give us a little uh, update on what you got going. Yeah, so we, we started in, in Haiti in 2014, and 
um, doing a community development program down there, and it's really exploded. Um, we started with the children's home. We have 41 kids in our orphanage. We have a school that started with, you know, 60 kids. We have 400 kids now in our school that come from the community. Wow. Uh, we have a hospital that a kid that grew up in our orphanage became a doctor, seven years of medical school in Port-au-Prince, became a doctor, and he runs our hospital. Uh, we have a vocational school, water and sanitation. Uh, Adam Wainwright and his wife are involved. Uh, ourselves and another partner out of Pittsburgh. Uh, and then two years into that, we started our program here in North City, St. Louis. Um, same thing, same idea, community development, uh, employing local uh, workers to kind of uh, uh, renovate some of these houses that are in terrible condition and bring them back to their original beauty from some of them in the 1890s. Uh, and then place families in those homes uh, with with help that will help them get stabilized and, and get them on their feet so that they can transition out and have um, you know, their kids can have a successful uh, future. And, and so we get to do some other things. We built a house for a family in Haiti that we, we don't typically do, but it was a really unique situation and, you know, um, just a really touching story. And then we actually just had a lady, uh, she's leaving today from Fort Lauderdale. She's stayed with uh, at our house with us, but she's a nurse in our, in our uh, program in Haiti at our hospital and was in heart failure, 35 years old. Mm. And uh, they told her it was going to be $25,000 to fix it. And uh, we kind of made some, some calls and, and got her here. Uh, she just had heart surgery on Tuesday. Um, and the, the cardiologist told me, he said, Kyle, you, she had about two months before she was going to go to bed and not wake up. Her heart, 10 years of high blood pressure and, and lack of, of resources and meds to treat it um, caused her to be in heart failure. And her heart was operating at such a low level. Um, so she got a device put in. She's on medication. And she's going to have a full recovery. And, and it's, you know, not every day, like we get to do some cool things, but not every day does somebody look at you and say, literally, if you didn't intervene, this lady, you know, she has two kids, she's 35 years old and wasn't going to make it. So man. we get to do some great things outside of our daily stuff. Um, but it's awesome, man. We've had such great support that we get to take those things on, you know, and say, without a doubt, for sure, we're going to do this. We're going to, you know, expand what we do and, and take things like this on. And um, so it's been a lot of fun. I, it, it's, you know, it's what I love to do. It's, it's what, you know, I have a platform. I want to use that to help other people and um, to see other people jump on and support that and, uh, and, and say, Hey, we, we believe in you and what you're doing and want to be a part of it has been awesome. So um, it, it's been a lot of fun. My wife and I enjoy it. And, you know, my kids get to see it and be a part of it. And my, my daughter made signs for the lady and our doctor that came up for this trip on their door. And, Aww. you know, they get to see that, you know, how, how do you treat people when you don't know them, when they don't speak your language and they look different than you, um, but they need help. Right. And, um, you know, so it led to conversations of, Hey, if you're at lunch and somebody's not sitting next to somebody, go sit by them, you know, and, um, make sure that you're the one that, that stands out and sticks up for people that, uh, that sometimes aren't able to be stuck up for. Oh, that's great for the kids, man. Sometimes the kids get like, uh, you know, complacent. They don't realize that other people yeah. have it. <laughs> you have it better than a lot of people. And sometimes <laughs> it's a little wake up call. So those guys are always in the mix, man. Your family looks so adorable when you're posting stuff out there in your farm, man. <laughs> You look like you're having a good time. Kyle, you're the man. Appreciate you coming on, bud. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. See you, Thanks, big boy. Kyle. That's awesome. Kyle McClellan right there. He was so good to me, man. Such a cool thing. Two guys come growing up here playing. He'd always hook me up with stuff. I get. He'd always be at the games. And be like, hey, I showed you out of your fight last night and stuff. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. He just was so good to me, man. I Holy remember cool also, so my first year in St. Louis was 2008. Yeah. And so I got here right after opening day. I think my... My first weekend here was it was the NFL draft, so it was late April. But Kyle McClellan, that was his first year, and so he obviously was a big story, the local guy, his yeah. first year. He was really good, man. Oh man. He was really good out of the bullpen. That was cool. Started some games there as well. Yeah. So his role, we were saying, I mean, that type of guy has a ton of value. I mean, did back then, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But now that guy that oh, can give wow. you multiple innings, he can be a starter, he can give you that spot start if somebody gets hurt, that guy in uh, in Major League Baseball right now, you're seeing tons of guys throwing an inning and two thirds, two innings, two and a yeah. third innings. I mean, he he's perfect for that type of role. Yeah, just a good overall guy. Sometimes you again, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and like, am I doing enough? <laughs> you know, like just just. And by the way, when he went down to Haiti, like that was right after the earthquake, and like things don't get uh, rebuilt quick down there. You know, the government likes to steal things and money and this, that, and the other. And then not to mention, I think down there the other day, they had a bunch of bunch of people down there for helping, kind of like what he's doing, and they all got kidnapped. I don't know if they were saved. I don't know. But, like, that's what he's dealing with. Like, I bitch about, like, people calling me for, like, uh, to go drop a puck somewhere. 
When Seth wants some blues tickets. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my God. So he's just doing great work. Great guy. Jacked. You'd want to be, you, if you're out in the wilderness with him, like you're going to be okay. If you're out in the wilderness with anybody in this room, you're not going to be okay. It's just that simple. I like to hang out with guys like that. And I, I love, I've seen some of the pictures of what he's doing in, uh, in North City. Like you yes. said, you got some of these buildings, you got the urban blight where you'll go down some of these streets and you just see a bunch of bricks. You see bricks. <laughs> yeah, man. You see dilapidated buildings and he and his foundation, they're making these houses look nice again. And people want to move in, and they're helping out these yep. folks and getting them on their feet. It's fantastic. I know.